This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with my streaming service, Nebula. Hey, happy Friday. This week, I'll explain the big changes coming to Android tablets and foldables in the form of Android 12 L, then the brand new Intel processors, which are kind of a big deal, and also Facebook's big announcements around the metaverse. We're also back with a tech knowledge quiz again. It's got 20 brand new questions to test your tech knowledge on, so check it out. Links are in the description and welcome to the Friday checkout. We've had lots of interesting new releases this week, including Palm coming back from the dead to release, what else, a pair of wireless earbuds, except The Verge found that they're probably just slightly tweaked earphones from a random Amazon seller, duh. DJI came out with the Action 2, a competitor to the GoPro Session that is modular, so you can magnetically add things like an extra front-facing screen on top of it if you want. Then we have the Pimax Reality 12K QLED VR, which looks like a bonkers high-end VR headset. And finally, my favorite, the Sony Xperia Pro I. Yes, Pro I, that is how you pronounce that, because Sony is terrible at names. Anyway, the phone has a pretty rugged build. Sony made an optional external monitor and other accessories for it, so you can use it for vlogging, and a full one inch sensor with a variable aperture that goes between F2 and F4. An absolute must, in my opinion, as sensors are getting this big, so things still remain crisp. I love to see Sony digging deeper and deeper into their niche, and I really hope that they don't mess this one up, because it looks fabulous on paper. To see all of the new releases of the week, including prices and links. Check out the full release monitor in the Crowd app. Links are in the description. Okay, my first story of the week will be Google announcing Android 12 L, which they call an operating system optimized for large screens, as well as a host of very exciting new developer updates to make Android apps adapt much better to different form factors, such as foldables, tablets, and computers. Google says there were 100 million new Android tablets sold this year. Chrome OS sales were up 92%. In total, there are now two 250 million active large screen Android devices and foldable sales are up 265% as well. And of course, Android apps are also coming to Windows 11 by default very soon. You can see my video about that somewhere here. So it is clear that Android apps need to start working on non-traditional smartphone form factors very soon. So Android 12 L itself brings things like an optional built-in app tray and better multitasking options out of the box and lots of system elements such as the notification shade now display in multiple columns on large devices by default. Better yet, Google has also announced developer tools that should make it much easier for apps to dynamically adjust to different screen sizes and postures on the fly without having to restart the apps. In my Fold 3 review, which should be coming out in a few days, I complain about this quite a bit. But Android 12 L now basically lets developers lay out different pages of their apps in different buckets and simply declare how these pages should appear on small, medium, and large screens, for example, doing multiple columns and pop-ups on large screens, while they do single pane views on small screens, and Android automatically figures out what screen size and posture the person is on and handles the handover between them. Not only that, this should also make it easier to create apps that can be resized on the fly, for example, on a Chromebook, a Windows computer, or as you'll soon see in my Fold 3 review, in DeX, all while remembering the app states and maintaining that between sizes. Of course, various app makers have sort of hacked similar things together in their apps already, and other platforms such as responsive websites have been doing similar things for many, many years now, but it is really cool to see that this is coming by default to the Android platform itself. There was also a lot of talk about improvements to keyboard and mouse support, which is currently mediocre at best, and Google says that the Fold 3, as well as a few tablets, should be able to start testing these changes very soon. I think Android on big screens finally has some real momentum behind it, and so if everything works out, this could make devices like the Fold 3 or Android tablets or Chrome OS work significantly better in the future. Fingers crossed they don't just abandon it and forget about it in a couple of months. Okay, my second story of the week will be Intel announcing their brand new 12th generation processors. And after a few years of basically terrible performance, these seem like a significant update for two main reasons. First, we have a brand new CPU setup with a couple of high performance cores that are paired with low energy efficiency cores. This is pretty common in the mobile and ARM chip world, where we call this big little, but it's the first time somebody pulled 
pulled it off at scale in a desktop x86 processor. On top of this, there is a software layer that Intel built in collaboration with Microsoft to make sure that background tasks such as Windows Update, etc. will automatically be offloaded to the smaller cores, which would of course mean less power usage for those tasks to run, but also the big cores could be reserved for high performance workloads without being bothered. Intel has so far only announced 12th generation desktop processors, which is cool, I guess, but obviously I think this kind of design would make the most sense in laptops where energy efficiency is super important. There's a reason why all these big little designs originally came from the mobile world. And the other big news is that these are finally supposed to be mainstream chips using Intel's new and very confusingly named Intel 7 process, which they previously called the 10 nanometer process. I'm not going to go into Intel's naming mess, but if you followed their saga at all, basically for many, many years, one of the main things that was holding them back was that they were stuck on their 14 nanometer process. They weren't able to move past that for many, many years, and it looks like they now finally did it. There are also a bunch of smaller updates like support for DDR5 memory and PCIe Gen 5. And while we will obviously have to wait for real benchmarks to decide if the chips are any good, the new architecture and the new manufacturing process both at least have the promise to be the first major positive news coming out of Intel in a long time. Okay, and my third story of the week will be Facebook, the entire company rebranding itself to Meta, announcing it is no longer a mobile internet company, but a metaverse company and laying out what the hell the metaverse is actually supposed to be. Okay, here's the easiest way I can try to explain it. Facebook is saying that AR and VR, they're kind of like computers before the internet came around. They're all stuck in their own little walled gardens, sort of like little intranets. There are multiple platforms such as Oculus, Steam VR, Windows Mixed Reality, and the Vive platform, and each is a sort of walled garden. A user has avatars, achievements, a bunch of programs like games, a list of friends, etc., all inside those platforms, or at least within apps within those platforms. Sure, there is some interoperability between them, like crossplay between games maybe, but everything is pretty walled off. So Facebook thinks that in the future you have to kind of break down some of these walls and instead you have to build some shared infrastructure and also some interoperability between these platforms. Sort of like a meta platform in which other platforms exist or a metaverse. This would be to AR and VR kind of like what the internet was to computers. In the metaverse, users should be able to move their avatars, their digital goods such as achievements or any NFTs that they own, and they should be able to have shared spaces with people across platforms. That, by the way, also includes creating basically a shared world scale map between companies that you can place digital objects in that any headset or any app can interact with. That object then is not inside Oculus or something like VR chat, but on the metaverse basically, available to see for all. You can already have cross-platform experiences in some apps, for example, VR chat, but Facebook thinks that this shouldn't only happen inside specific apps, but sort of also on an infrastructure level. Facebook made three apps that they call Horizon Home, Horizon World, and Horizon Work that are essentially compatible with the metaverse. They recently announced that they have abandoned their proprietary Oculus APIs to embrace OpenXR, which is essentially a set of industry standard open APIs shared across vendors to make porting apps and games easier. The company is apparently also spending $10 billion this year alone to build the metaverse. Apparently it will take 5 to 10 years to get it properly up and running and they're saying that all the industry players should come together to build it with them. So they're saying that they basically started the metaverse but they don't really want it to be theirs in the same way that the US Department of Defense, despite having built many of the early technologies of the internet, doesn't own the entire internet. This is supposed to be a cross-industry platform and Facebook wants to be one player on the platform. Although probably it wants to be the biggest one, of course. Sounds like a sort of science fiction movie. I just don't know if it will be a utopian one or a dystopian one. Science fiction movies have predicted a lot of the tech trends, but have you ever wondered what served as the inspiration for the filmmakers who dreamt up some of these sci-fi computers? Well, that's what we explore in episode 2 of Technorama, my Nebula original, that just came out, including connections like why you can blame Ronald Reagan for Terminator and many more. We're taking a look at six movies from the 60s to the 80s and breaking down the hidden technology 
these historical and economic events that led to their creation, explaining why the 80s were so particularly obsessed with killer robots for example. Technorama is of course on Nebula, our very own video streaming platform built by some of YouTube's smartest educational creators, and it hosts not only complete originals like Technorama, but also our regular YouTube videos at free, often a day or two early, little bonus segments after videos, and more. If you'd like to support our work and get high quality extra content in return, Nebula is the best way to do that, and signing up is super affordable with the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle. At just 15 bucks for an entire year, not a month but a full year, you get access to all of Nebula and all of Curiosity Stream, which of course is the premier place on the internet for high quality professional documentaries from the founder of the Discovery Channel with a huge library of science, nature, and history content to watch, such as Engineering the Future, which I think my audience would particularly like. So check them out at the link in the description and I'll see you next week.